Welcome to our webinar, Sustainable Development in South Asia. The MIT South Asian Alumni Association, MITSA, and the MIT Alumni Energy, Environment, and Sustainability Network, EESN, are co-sponsoring this event. I'm Sarah Simon, coordinator of EESN. Our worldwide network connects MIT alumni and educates our communities on our EESN themes and their complex interconnected challenges, including climate change. To do this, EESN sponsors monthly online webinars like this one. Our network also promotes alumni work, books, and reports with the goal of our groups exchanging ideas, taking action, and building solutions for a better and sustainable world. Our network groups are often based in the MIT clubs and the MIT alumni affinity groups. GK Kalyanaram reached out to the network several months ago. He was convinced that many alums in MITSA were interested in climate and EESN concerns, and they would make a powerful subgroup. Certainly the development of India and the rest of South Asia has a huge impact on the health of our planet and our society. Today, I am pleased his effort has resulted in this program. Over to you, GK. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, uh, good evening, or good night, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Gurumurti Kalyanaram. I'm a member of the board of MIT South Asian Alumni Association. And uh, we are a community of the South Asian alumni. And our purpose is to connect the institute to the alumni and the alumni to the institute and the alumni with each other. And uh, we are a group of about 5,500 alumni scattered all around the world. Joining us today in this digital event are, of course, the MIT's uh, Energy, Environment, and Sustainability Network. You just heard from Sarah. And joining us also uh, is the MIT Water Club. Uh, MIT Water Club focuses on research and policy, conceptualization and initiation and uh, development on water resources, management, conservation related issues. Also joining us is MISTI India, MIT in India, uh, which really focuses on developing an awareness uh, and opportunities for hands-on experience in India for students and faculty. Uh, we have, uh, MISTI has uh, conducted, has uh, done over a thousand uh, internships over the last uh, 20 years, and several faculty have visited and done research in India. Also joining us is the South Asia Graduate School of Design, the uh, um, uh, students, uh, body from there, and they focus on issues related to South Asia and as those issues relate to larger uh, global uh, uh, polity and economy and society. Joining us uh, is also a large number of uh, members from a particular university in India, Vellore Institute of Technology, a fine private institution uh, named recently by the government of India as an institute of excellence. Thank you, thank you, all of you. And a word about today's uh, digital event. Uh, I don't have to uh, uh, inform this audience about the timeliness and the importance of this topic all over the world, uh, even more poignantly for us in South Asia. We're just coming off the Glasgow summit last Friday and uh, agreement on Saturday. Here with us today um, are uh, very thoughtful uh, individuals to share their insights. We have uh, Chintan Vaishna, uh, who is a doctoral uh, alumnus of MIT uh, and uh, a faculty member here at MIT, uh, but currently he's on leave. He's in New Delhi in India, and he is the director. Uh, the mission director of Atal Innovation Mission, uh, conceptualized and established by the current, current government about five, six, seven years back to foster, encourage innovation and an ecology uh, in all areas. Following Chintan, uh, we have uh, uh, Radhika Singh, uh, who is a very recent uh, uh, alumna, and Shail Joshi. Uh, her classmate, a recent alumnus, uh, graduates, uh, 2020 graduates of the Department of Urban Planning. They have produced a marvelous book, uh, Betwa, 
uh, walk along the Bundelk and uh, River, and um, it's poignant, it's personal, it's rich, and you will hear from them uh, about insights from that experience and maybe beyond. And to discuss the book uh, and the insights from that in greater detail is Professor Birsh Sanyal, a very distinguished professor at MIT, been there for a long time. He's the uh, Ford International Professor of Urban Development and Planning. He heads the uh, program on special uh, program on urban and regional studies called SPUR. And uh, Birsh's contributions to MIT and to the urban development, regional development, thinking through this areas are remarkable uh, in many ways sustained. He has also been the chair of MIT's faculty, a very distinguished uh, recognition by his peers. Thank you, Bish. And uh, following Bish, uh, we don't have him here uh, in the gallery. He'll be joining us shortly is Professor Jeff Sachs, uh, University Professor at Columbia, a very distinguished uh, a scholar and a policy uh, a designer, advisor to governments and institutions and including UN. And, uh, Conceptualizer, uh, conceptualizer of the UN Millennium Goals and more. He will. Uh, he has a particular interest in India. He has been advisor to government of India uh, 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 a couple of years and decades back. And we will have him uh, make his observations uh, about uh, South Asia, sustainability, and the related issues. Following uh, Jeff Sachs' uh, uh, presentation remarks, we will uh, have a question and answer session. Uh, the length of it, of course, determines on how uh, uh, the conversation flows uh, this morning. Um, thank you all uh, uh, for joining. As Sarah mentioned, the interest is compelling here, urgent, and therefore we are initiating uh, an interest group uh, on South Asia and sustainability and energy under the umbrella of MIT South Asian Alumni Association and the uh, ESS and uh, group here at MIT. Thank you all for joining. Now I'm going to turn over the web space to Chintan Vaishnav. Chintan, thank you for coming. Thanks, GK, and uh, thanks, uh, South Asian Alumni Association. Uh, uh, appearing here brings back some wonderful memories of uh, festivities together. Uh, at the Kresge Auditorium. Uh, let me let me very quickly share my screen. Uh, and then we get started. Um, do you see my screen? I take it. Yes, excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, so so uh, I, I I thought. Well, let, let me start by saying that uh, I am not an expert on this topic. Uh, and I don't uh, know many that are. Uh, in other words, I feel that uh, um, I can't be on the sidelines um, and uh, uh, I have to do what I can. And I will have to work with many, many people to <clears throat> solve this challenge uh, in a way which is in some ways uh, unprecedented. In fact, I feel that most people I meet, uh, most people I work with who are often not, uh, who are often not the poorest of poor people, although I work with many poor communities, uh, 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 even struggle to empathize with the importance of this topic. Um, and so, so, so let me start, uh, uh, by saying that I'm here to learn as at, at least as much as what I might share. Um, now, uh, in terms of uh, uh, framing the big problem, and I, I what what I what I decided uh, here in terms of the presentation was that I'll, I'll share with us some uh, uh, some information that just puts us on the same page with respect to uh, South Asia. Uh, then I want to say a little bit about India, and then I want to say where is the role of what kind of things are happening in the innovation space in India, because uh, Innovation Mission is the one I am uh, uh, currently a part of. Uh, and uh, if you sort of look at institutionally, uh, um, 
uh, if you look at the in industry um, on one hand, government on the other, civil society, the third piece, uh, families, maybe um, uh, the fourth piece, institutions. Uh, then I think uh, innovation ecosystem, the fifth piece, let's say, uh, innovation ecosystem is really the only uh, uh, channel through which young people seem to uh, help uh, our nation take a risk in order to solve some of the most pressing challenges in innovative ways. In other words, the other conventional institutions are not taking risks. So if you look at industry, they are going to do something that is significantly technologically or uh, uh, market-wise de-risked. Uh, if you look at governments, even more, uh, 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 they procure things that are even more de-risked. If you look at family, they want their engineers because those, uh, those uh, 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 lines of work are more de-risked. Uh, so it's really only these young innovators who are doing something interesting uh, and risky uh, that may have higher risk, but they that could also have higher rewards. And I wanna give some examples of those. Um, so that's what I'll end on. So, so let me, let me uh, uh, start by uh, sharing with you how I think uh, 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 of this as a, a uh, grand challenge uh, in, in a framing that is more of an engineer's framing. Uh, so uh, where, where if you think about an objective function, uh, you think about the inputs that are at your disposal to uh, meet those objectives. And then you think about the constraint that you can't violate uh, in meeting these objectives. So those three pieces, the objective input functions and the constraint, right? So the objective function is, um, that uh, we 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 want to uh, 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 we want to stay within let's say let's stick simplistically I'll say uh, stay within the two degree temperature rise or one point five degree temperature rise or whichever one you like but pick pick your objective um, the input at the grand level the input there are two dials imagine you have two dials one dial is the current uh, economy that you have to uh, dial down and the other one is going to be the new uh, renewable energy based uh, economy that you have to dial up uh, and uh, so they're simplistically again two dials um, and the constraint uh, that's in front of us is uh, that uh, uh, we we uh, uh, we need to do this in a way where uh, people who are suffering don't suffer more. Let's keep that as a simple constraint. Uh, and, and in that framing, you will recognize that this is really a very difficult act that we have not done before. Uh, none of us have done this before. So we figure this out. This is what we're trying to figure out. So that's my, my framing of this problem. Uh, so, so, so let me, Let's dive into uh, 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 into. Uh, let me see here. Uh, I'll put myself somewhere here. Sorry, I have to manage a small screen here. So, um, <clears throat> but uh, so 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 the challenge uh, we know uh, uh, this picture. I'm sure you have seen uh, that. Uh, 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 if you look at the greenhouse gas emission, uh, you see the line going up. That's China. Uh, India somewhere, uh, somewhere here, also going up. Uh, this is 1990 to 2010. And uh, 1990s were the warmest decade, 2005 was the warmest year, uh, melting of glaciers, rising sea levels, all of these things you, we know, right? Uh, 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 Arctic uh, cloud, uh, Arctic could be, uh, could be, uh, free of ice within 100 years, that, that's a major disaster and so on. And developing countries have a, a, an even more a grave problem uh, uh, because uh, the geography uh, is not favorable. We'll talk a little more about that a little later. Uh, the assets are limited, right? So in crises, I think here, this is where your assets are needed because 
in crisis, if you don't have assets, then you are plunged into even more poor, poor to become even more even poorer. Um, and, and then uh, uh, there's a greater dependence on uh, climate sensitive sources of income. So because there are a lot of poor people, they are ecological dependence more so than you know uh, omnivores who have resources to buy anything from anywhere. Uh, so so that's sort of the overarching picture. Uh, right? If you look at South Asia's greenhouse gas contribution, uh, just the left, left hand pie is all of South Asia. Look at the three slices, largest slices of this pie uh, are India's uh, <clears throat> uh, N2O, uh, India's CO2, and India's methane. And that's this part of the pie. And everybody else, that's Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Nepal, Maldives, all of them are right here. So you see the uh, it's the India's contribution, primarily because large nation, uh, uh, large population, uh, more economic activity to begin with, uh, and so on. So that's that's that. Look at the right hand side picture. There, here. Uh, on the x-axis, you have these nations, and on the y-axis, sort of the metric tons of carbon, uh, and and what it is made up of, right? So these light blue things are agriculture. So see, it, 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 all all nations: Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, a big chunk of agriculture uh, uh, contribution. In India, even after agriculture being the largest, uh, it, it, it being the uh, sector where most more number of Indians are employed, it's still, it's smaller. So there's a lot more contribution from the industry and so on. But this is sort of what it looks like right now. Um, so uh, <clears throat> if, if you look at uh, from the COP26, which, which uh, just uh, uh, was underway, um, um, uh, it, 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 in the carbon space, uh, you know, we uh, IPCC says that for the two degree, uh, uh, rise to keep it within two degree. We have four thousand gigatons of CO two that we can emit. Uh, uh, we have already emitted about uh, twenty five hundred, I mean twenty six hundred uh, uh, gigatons of CO two already. And so, uh, depending on whether you want to keep it to one point five, one point seven, or two degrees. Uh, the total space available to us collectively is about 500, 850, or 1,350. So not, not a lot of space uh, uh, available to us, right? If you want to keep it uh, 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 within six, six, okay, I won't go into the percentiles, uh, 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 but, but basically we realize that uh, collectively, there's not a lot of room to achieve this. Uh, and if you go to 1.5 degrees, even less room to achieve it. Um, so uh, South, South, South Asia in particular, I mean, vulnerability-wise, um, um, uh, again, uh, high level of poverty, right? Uh, and population density, uh, and particularly ecological dependence. I mean, 600 people, 600 million people uh, under $1.25 a day. Uh, uh, natural disaster-wise, and I, I was actually surprised to see these numbers the first time I saw it, that 50% of South Asians, that is 750 million people, that's like, whatever, you know, two and a half times the United States, um, have, have experienced uh, some or the other natural disaster in the last two decades. Uh, and uh, that, that means about 230,000 deaths and about $45 billion of damages. So again, this is really significant impact. Um, uh, and uh, 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 of course, these things, retreating glaciers, uh, heavy reliance on monsoon, this is one big thing that often, you know, uh, uh, is uh, uh, people don't appreciate it fully, but, 70% uh, of uh, South Asian po population uh, have, have uh, uh, only a four month period of uh, monsoon. And it is, they either have too much water, that is a great monsoon, particularly cities, or too little water. Uh, and so, so in, uh, I'm currently speaking to you from Bangalore, for example. Um, and um, in Bangalore, uh, you, if you have floods, um, you have too much water. We don't know where to uh, uh, send it. 
uh, and most of the time in the year you have too little water so there are all these bore wells that are trying to you know uh, uh, extract water and and are affecting the ground groundwater table so uh, again um, very uh, 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 difficult balance um, so so uh, in terms of the way forward i mean the, the four pillars that are again recognized and i'm just sharing this from various sources with you but so again to put us on the same page but uh, 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 one is the restructuring of the economy. This is the going from the old economy. These are the two knobs that I'm talking about, the going from the old economy to the new economy. Obviously, it will re require public policy. Uh, it will uh, need um, uh, uh, and other measures, repurposing the land. So these are really big things that need to be done, right? Uh, Reskilling and skilling of workforce, maybe Bish would say something about it, but this is, you know, because we're going from the old to the new, uh, you know, uh, job losses, how do you minimize it? How do you retrain people? How do you skill new people differently? All of that, it's massive, massive issues uh, to solve. Um, I want to, uh, uh, GK has appeared, that really means that I need to finish up. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so so let me go and say, okay, so India is part of it. I told you that India is big, so let me not spend time on that, okay? Let me say what's happening in the innovation ecosystem, right? So, so uh, um, the innovation ecosystem, I mean, if you broadly look at it, uh, it is basically this transducer where you put creativity on one side, on the input side, and out comes as innovations and uh, startups and solutions and so on, right? At Atal Innovation Mission, this is the office that I uh, <clears throat> I, I, I had. Uh, uh, here, we are, we are doing four types of things on pretty large scale. So one is uh, uh, igniting young minds through maker spaces in schools. So we have now cl built close to 10,000 of them uh, in schools all over India. And every year, you get something close to um, uh, something close to about twenty thousand or so ideas when we run a marathon, uh, ideas marathon, and people sort of uh, put out ideas and build things and so on. These are school children between sixth and twelfth grade, so that's one thing that's happening. And some very fascinating things there. Uh, 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 of course, the incubation and acceleration scenario. This is like the Martin Trust Center of MIT, but we've built there are about five hundred of them in India. Uh, at different scales in different parts of uh, academia, industry, and so on. So that's the second thing. We there are seventy that are under uh, our uh, my office. Um, uh, then uh, we we run these large innovation challenges where government or ministries submit problem statements, and we run an innovation challenge. These are sort of the grand challenges, moon shards, however you want to imagine them. And then fourth is, of course, uh, engaging a whole bunch of ecosystem actors. So the inflection point here is that we have built a lot of infrastructure for innovation, but we have to go towards the uh, sort of a, uh, more of an ecosystem for innovation, but a lot of work going on in this direction. Uh, the ideas that are coming out <clears throat> are quite interesting. Um, here's an idea I'm, I'm sharing uh, about, about uh, 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 farmers in drought prone regions. So there are two parts to this innovative idea. One is how do you change their cropping behavior to hardier crops? That's one thing. And second is how do you give them decentralized off the grid solutions for value addition? So this is happening on a large scale, right? Uh, similarly, uh, if you look at uh, sort of uh, cold storage, uh, one of the greatest challenge of an Indian farmer is that uh, uh, they, when they go to a market, they have to sell there because they don't have storage facility and many crops are perishable and so on. So again, a decentralized sort of uh, 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 storage that can be owned by farmer groups uh, uh, in a uh, sort of economically viable way is uh, something that we're doing. Let me end with this last example of this uh, uh, little uh, girl, Yashaswini. She is in class seven. Uh, and her father is the in charge of the maker space in her school that we built. And Yashaswini is uh, very passionate about uh, environmental protection. And she noticed that there's all this weed in her, uh, in her um, uh, village. She gathered it and uh, her father taught her, how do you, uh, how do you sort of uh, make, uh, 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 with a binding agent, make uh, uh, 
sheets of it that you can sort of precisely cut and measure and so on and then you can make pens uh, these are uh, biodegradable pens from these weeds and now she runs workshops in villages in the neighboring villages teaching children uh, how to make these pens of course pen is not the point of this right a maker space is also not the point of it the point of it is that uh, this uh, some people like this uh, children like this are getting connected to what they're passionate about and many of them are much more passionate about the environment when they're younger than when they engage with the uh, mainstream economy so let me uh, well, let me stop there Thank you, Chintan. That was lovely. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I'm sorry we rushed you a little bit. There is so much that uh, you can share and uh, we can listen and enjoy, but there'll be plenty of opportunities. You come back to us, uh, to the forum again, and uh, we will we will meet. Thank you again, Chintan. Okay, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for putting this together. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now you can enjoy other presentations and then participate in Q&A. But let me turn over to Radhika and Shail. Uh, I guess Shail and Radhika is the order. As I already introduced you, they are recent uh, uh, alumni of the Department of Urban Planning, uh, 2020 alumni. They have produced a marvelous book, uh, Betwa, uh, ec Ecological Issues Along in Bundelkhan, Walk uh, Along the River. Now, it's over to you, uh, Shail and Radhika. Thank you so much. Thank you, GK. Um... It's an honor to be a part of this panel with some esteemed colleagues. Um, it's great to be here and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Shail Joshi and my co-author and my friend's name is Radhika Singh. I'll be presenting for the first half of the presentation followed by Radhika um, and to talk about sustainable development in rural India. Uh, we're going to be illustrating a case of a region in India in the northern part of India called Bundelkhand and its ongoing water issues to highlight some tensions in sustainable development. Um, and this kind of also, we're gonna, it talks about um, some of the points that even Chintan conveyed about agriculture, about decentralization and about different cropping patterns. Um, so back in 2019, through the Moving Upstream Fellowship uh, hosted by Way the India Foundation and Out of Eden Walk, uh, we walked along the Betwa River, which passes through the Bundelkan region. Um, walking around 130 kilometers, and we stayed in around 10 different villages. Our aim was to understand the state of riparian lives um, in consistently drought-prone and drought-hit regions. After a walk, we ended up writing a master's thesis on reasons behind ineff ineffective water governance in India, and with a focus on the region of Bundelkhand. We also recently published, like uh, GK mentioned, a book called Along the Betwa. These are some snippets from it which uses visual and written mediums to kind of convey our experience of the walk while talking about livelihoods and environmental problems in the region. Um, by no means, this book is kind of trying to convey a comprehensive picture uh, of the situation in Mundelkhand, but we rather hope that we can generate rather uncomfortable but necessary conversations, which can provide a nuanced entry uh, to bridge the massive urban and rural uh, divide in our knowledge and kind of start having meaningful conversations with our friends, family, and peers. Um, to situate the region and the river itself, um, the Beta originates in the region of Madhya Pradesh, which is in the darker, which is the state in the darker gray area, and uh, also is part of the uh, other another state called Uttar Pradesh, which is in lighter gray. The region that are further highlighted within the map is the region of Bundelkhand. And uh, the blue line is the river Betwa, where the map shows the part that is highlighted in orange. Bundelkhand is one of the most poorest districts and the most drought-prone areas um, in the country. Most districts within Bundelkhand are either in the most backward or low and to medium developed category, which is determined by regions, resource base, levels of technological applications, and economic relations. Bundelkhand is also more economically unequal than, it's, than the state it lies in. People from lower castes and scheduled tribes, the indigenous people of India, face higher incidences of poverty. To talk a bit more about water, for water insecurity, uh, it, it is one of the biggest challenges Bundelkhand faces, both for, for the environment as well as for the livelihoods. While Bundelkhand was always a drought-prone region, several factors have exacerbated the water scarcity. These include political mismanagement, 
ineffective institutions and changing weather patterns and short term planning. However, by far the biggest contributor to water scarcity is irrigation. Agriculture is the biggest sector in the region, employing majority of the people in the region. Much of this depends on irrigation. In some districts, up to 98% of the water is used in agriculture, which is drawn from bore wells, which uh, draw groundwater hundreds of meters below the surface. Decades of uncontrolled abstraction has led to near collapse of the water table, which is the level at which groundwater can be found. This means that people now have to spend exponential amounts of money to drill deeper and deeper, which obviously uh, means that water is often a resource that only the very privileged can use. As we speak about this in our book, caste, class, and gender inequalities mean that scarcity affects certain parts of the population much more than others. As one farmer actually told us on our walk, and I quote, last season there were two months of continuous rain. But when we need water, it does not come. I cannot get a tube well, which is like a bore well, because it costs five lakh rupees, approximately six and a half thousand dollars. Even then, I do not know if the water will come. Sometimes, after all that effort, you only get two inches of water. With that amount, can a farmer water his fields or just take a bath? Those of uh, further away from those who live further away from the rivers or water bodies are often much more affected. But even those living close to the Betwa told us how the river was shrinking right before their eyes. Since rivers are fed by aquifers, the over-abstraction of groundwater has meant that there is less underground water that feeds into rivers. To talk a bit more about the implications of sustainable development, the dynamic between environment and livelihoods is one of the central tensions in sustainable development. Environmental resources are exploited to uh, improve livelihoods. However, livelihoods often become very dependent on these resources and therefore extremely vulnerable to changes in this resource base. It might, be, it might be helpful to take a step back and consider how this unsustainable and unchecked groundwater abstraction began in the first place. India was facing a massive food shortage and multiple famines in the decades after independence, that is 1947. In the late 60s, international donors and the Indian government embarked on an industrialization process aimed at increasing yields and productivity. Called the Green Revolution, this included drilling massive amounts of tube wells and bore wells of for irrigation. As an effect of the Green Revolution, farmers in many parts of the country became much more prosperous. Millions of farmers could grow higher value crops that depend on irrigation and that use extra income to improve their standard of living. However, we now know that green revolution led to soil degradation, pollution, and ecological disasters. It has led to an enormous amount of water scarcity, placing millions of livelihoods at risk, rendering them at best unstable and at worst unprofitable. This balance between improving livelihoods through the use of environmental resources and then also protecting environmental resources from overexploitation is extremely difficult to achieve. While some level of resource extraction seems necessary for growth, there comes a point in which environmental degradation begins to harm the very people development is supposed to benefit. We are going to talk about three different dilemmas, and one of this is the first one uh, Chintan rightly alluded to, which is cropping patterns. A striking example of this dynamic is the fact that so many people in Bundelkhand are growing rice and wheat, two extremely water intensive crops. These crops usually fetch good prices in the market, and even when they don't, um, the government gives them uh, what we call the minimum support price for growing them. Other crops that are less water intensive and more drought resistant, like pulses, do not fetch as much money. Therefore, over the decades, thousands of hectares of land um, have been uh, used to grow wheat and rice instead of grains that are more conducive to the environments and the soil. In fact, 80% of groundwater abstracted for agriculture is spent on three crops, wheat, paddy, and sugarcane, all of which are extremely water intensive. The cost of irrigation, which might have made growing rice and wheat less profitable, is often negligible. Since electricity is so heavily subsidized in many parts of India, pumping up water through bore wells is nearly free. Policy makers are reluctant to change this because such a big voting block comprises farmers that benefit from free electricity. Policy makers are also reluctant to remove the price support for these water intensive crops as farmers believe 
that this will plunge them into even more financial insecurity, and rightly so. Some of these fears were evident in massive agricultural protests that took place in India over the last year. All of this is further complicated by the fact that many farmers are struggling with high levels of debt and farmer suicides are rising, have become a common place and have been rising over the last few decades. Um, P. Sainath has written a bunch about farmer suicides and their grim distress. To kind of go into the next few slides, I will pass on um, the presentation to Radhika. Thanks, Shail. Um, so, yeah, I'll just go right on to talking about the second dilemma, which is about infrastructure. So a le another lens through which we can understand this tension between, on one hand, improving livelihoods and on the other, protecting the environment is through the government infrastructure projects that are aimed at alleviating the water crisis. So to increase the water supply in Bundelkhand, the government is planning on a river linking project that will bring water from the Ken River to the Betwa River. This river linking project is projected to destroy thousands of acre in a nearby tiger reserve and also will lead to dozens of village, villages being displaced. And this is just one of the many river linking projects planned throughout the country. Another way the government is trying to increase water supply to the area is by building many large dams across the rivers in the region. But we all know that there's a growing consensus amongst water professionals that dams have an enormous negative effect on the riverine environment. And also in times of extreme droughts, the governments tend to build more boreholes and pumps and pump even more water from rivers and streams to increase water supply. However, all of these efforts to increase water supply in regions with extreme water scarcity is really not a permanent solution. Increasing water supply in Bundelkhand would likely only serve to increase water use. More and more people will turn towards growing wheat and rice, and the overall shortage of water would probably remain. Increasing water use may also worsen resilience to major drought events because people become so dependent on their water for their livelihoods. In all of this, it's really important to note how marginalized populations are much more vulnerable to the effects of drought. Not only do they have less resources to fall back on, members of the community and local government officials often deliberately exclude them in relief efforts. There have been so many cases documented where water relief tankers are, for instance, directed to bypass the lower, the lower cost parts of villages and directly serve the upper cost areas. It's also common to see lower cost villagers being actively threatened when they try to access community wells and ponds. All of this becomes exacerbated in times of scarcity. I'll no go, now go on to talking about the th third dilemma, which is on resource extraction. In this context of increasingly unprofitable agricultural production and growing water scarcity, people have had to turn to other sources of income. For instance, sand mining is a very common site in Budelkund, and, there, and hardly a day would pass when we wouldn't see dozens of trucks lining up to collect sand from the river. There was a lot of smaller scale extraction going on too, where entire families would sort of set out on their small fishing boats and collect sand and sacks to sell, even during the monsoon. This provided people with a little bit of extra income. Now, sand is in huge demand all over India for construction purposes, particularly in growing towns and cities. So it's a very lucrative business, but only a small, a small fraction of sand mining is actually legal the majority of operations are run, run illegally. In many ways, this is a, a typical resource extraction issue we see in so many capitalist economies where the mass extraction of resources in one region rarely tends to benefit those who are either employed in the extraction processes or are living in nearby vicinities. However, given the lack of resources or, and opportunities in the region, many villagers are forced to rely on sand mining for supplemental income. As one sand miner who we met on our river walk noted, we leave these mounds of sand by the banks and people come at night to take them. Each mound fetches us 600 rupees or approximately $8. We learned that dozens of families were employed in this business and they did it year round, even during the monsoon. After all, as he said, what other work was there for them to do? In general, the effect of this large scale sand mining is that groundwater recharge is hampered 
which then in turn exacerbates water scarcity. And this is because sand absorbs water and allows it to percolate back into the ground, recharging aquifers. Sand mining also causes riverbank erosion and decreases biodiversity, and therefore also contributes to a decline in water quality. So over the last couple of slides, we've outlined some of the tensions that exist between, on one hand, improving livelihoods, and on the other hand, trying to improve environmental protection. These are all things that we saw in our walk and also then encountered in our research on Bundelkhand. Overall, I think we can say that water has been abstracted in ever increasing amounts to improve people's livelihoods. But as the water diminishes, the very shaky foundations on which these livelihoods were built becomes increasingly clear to everyone. Many people that we met on the walk despaired of the potential for agriculture to provide them with the standard of living that they needed. And were looking desperately for other types of livelihoods that would not require them to leave behind their homes. For us, understanding more about this region and its people led us to the following questions. Do we have to accept these trade-offs between improving livelihoods and environmental protection as inevitable? Or is there a way to think creatively about a solution that does not pit environmental and livelihoods against one another, and in fact, even makes them codependent? In Jamori, one of the villages that we stayed in, the Pradhan, or the village head, said the following. Development always comes last to Bundelkhand. We do not have leaders of our own and have to depend on people from the outside to carry out projects in our interest. It would be good if Bundelkhand becomes a factory area so that we can get jobs that are close by. There was a very clear fear about the future. And as one of the women who was living in the Pradhan's house said, in our lifetimes, we will see the river disappear altogether, referring to the Betwa River. Finally, we'd like to end by noting that the situation in Bundelkhand is, is very representative of the water crisis that so many other regions in India face. Niti Aayog, which was formerly known as the Planning Commission of India, published a report in 2018 stating that 600 million people, or nearly half of India's population, face extreme water stress. India has become the world's largest extractor of groundwater, accounting for 25% of the world's total. And 70% of those sources are contaminated. The report's conclusion was that India is suffering from the worst water crisis of its history. So just to conclude, we think it's really important when trying to pursue sustainable development to keep in mind these tensions and trade-offs and complicate more simplistic narratives that try to gloss over these complexity. We hope that this presentation was helpful in contributing to this and adding to the existing wealth of literature that tries to identify some of the entry points into better understanding the problems of water scarcity in South Asia. Thank you. Over to you, GK. Thank you, Radhika and uh, Shail for that uh, uh, lovely presentation. And we are so delighted that you could produce this very good output in just a year after graduation. Thank you. Our best wishes, and it is very insightful. Now, we invite uh, Professor Bish Sanya, whom I uh, a, a introduced earlier, uh, a distinguished scholar and professor at MIT. And he was the department head of urban planning and regional studies. Uh, he was a chair of the faculty and many other distinct, uh, you know, distinctions. We uh, look forward to his uh, observations and comments about the book and related issues. Thank you. Thank you, GK. Let me put my slides in first. Um, I want to say that uh, thank the MIT Alumni Association. And, and well, I'm sorry, this is, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Uh, so I want to first thank the MIT Association, uh, Alumni Association for organizing this event. I am very proud of Radhika and Sahil's work. They're graduates of our program. It's wonderful to see Chintan. We just had a phone conversation a few weeks back, but he's doing all this incredible work in India. So this is a great opportunity for me to, to meet old friends, students, and share with all of you uh, what I sense is my interpretation, as I call it, along the Betwa. I enjoy reading this, reading this um, book. So first thing I want to say is that um, it's so beautifully written, this travel for the last, for the 10 days. And, you know, you feel like you are in India when you actually read this book. 
and uh, and the landscape of India, the people of India, the the constraints, yes, but the hospitality of these people, etc. I mean, it just the, the book is able to capture at the micro level what is going on. And I think it's interesting because this micro approach to looking at the world coming down from the high level to the people, um, as opposed to the macro view, which was more, uh, not necessarily wrong, but the, but the kind of views that Chintan had with these large graphs, aggregate numbers, etc. There are two different views of the world, uh, of the same world. Uh, and I think that what uh, Radhika and, and Shaheem has done is to bring us down to the ground level. And what I want to say is that this approach that kind of going to the ground level and looking at people, et cetera, is not necessarily, not necessarily uh, uh, new. Uh, it is actually an approach that started in the 1970s, uh, basically because there was a huge amount of work that time that top-down development approaches have not worked and and we need to go back to the ground level and find out how people actually survive and this came as as uh, as any top-down project large-scale projects infrastructure projects of the kind that that um, uh, radhika actually uh, criticized in terms of the joining of the rivers etc dams uh, there was a big reaction against that and in, in a sense, the argument was that neither the government, uh, which has been in, basically involved in industrialization, uh, has worked, nor has the market been able to provide the kind of income earning opportunities for vast number of people. And hence, there was a huge emphasis on celebration of people and community. And this came, if you look at the work of, of E.F. Schumacher in Small is Beautiful in 1972, or Eleanor Ostrom's work on, on community engagement, community management of, of resources, or James Scott's idea of seeing that seeing like the state, uh, they're all extremely critical of government and of the market, and is in a sense focus on the community and people saying, we need to know how they survive. And that's where the, the real answer has to come from. So this is a long tradition in which uh, Sahil and, and Radhika uh, uh, are, are writing. Now, the question is that how is Radhika and Sahil seeing different from what we saw in the 1970s? They are, they are gone there now, they spend time there. So how are they, their views different? And this is where I want to come to a little bit. So I think that I'm, I'm, I was very impressed by the way this walk, through the walk, uh, they were able to identify some very important topics which came up also in Chintan's presentation and of course their presentation. So water scarcity is a big crisis, agrarian crisis, not enough production of food, people moving uh, to, uh, to migrating to the, to the cities uh, from the rural areas, heavy sand mining, uh, and as I mentioned, paucity of employment. Now, the question is that those, those Shahil and, and Radhika do not, do not produce, they're not writing a book on social political theory. They are writing a book about how it is to walk in this, this grounded way and what you can see in people's houses, their faces, and that's why the pictures are so, so moving. So, but implicit in their, in their storytelling, or their seeing is also failure of government. The government has not worked and that the market also hasn't worked very well. So the, uh, and let me say, say a little bit about that. So how has the government intervention, is it a total failure? And what struck me is as I read their, their um, statements and their stories there were many mentions of many governmental programs for example the mnrega that's the national rural employment guarantee act uh, pmy pradhan mantri was jajona swaj bharat niti yoga playing a role in this study that that um, um, I, I think um, radhika mentioned uh, and, you know gram sabhas who's managing gram sabhas Aadhaar card, which was given by government. So what struck me is that I see government making many efforts. Uh, yes, I'm sure they haven't, not all of them have worked to the extent they should, but I was impressed by the how many different things the government is trying. Yes, they're far, far from, from Betwar area, but uh, let's not dismiss, let's not dismiss government's effort by, by saying nothing ha has, has worked. Even in their stories, Swaj Bharat mission, there are quotes by people saying Swaj Bharat has worked. 
uh, they're saying, yes, we don't get the, all the job, but we get some money from them. So, so it's always, we, I, we want to temper our criticism a bit, I think, to, to, to take into account the real performance. The uh, market failure, it's also very clear that they, they are basically saying, um, sorry, this is going bad. Uh, that the market has also failed to produce employment and then the focus on the sand mafia, which of course was very scary. And when I read them and they were going through that town, I was so scared how they managed to be safe. But anyway, the sand mafia as is pointed out as one key market actors who are working very hands and gloves with government employees, the, the, the Pradhan, et cetera. And that there's kind of a nexus between government uh, employees at the higher level and market these people like like mafia, which creates a very depressing picture of, of a nexus that I'm not sure how we're going to break out of it or who is going to help us get out of that. So I do think that Sahil and, and Radhika's views on the community is much more nuanced than what we saw before in the 1970s or 1980s. And first of all, the stories of hospitality are just so moving. These people with so little income, inviting them home, making the food. And you know, it's really moving for me to even read and then see these photographs of people's faces really working hard. At the same time, they, whatever they have, they want to share with these guests. But what is interesting in both Shahil's and, and Radhika's presentation is that they don't glorify this notion of community as if it's a one homogeneous group that is going to do all sorts of good things like, like Eleanor Ostrom and others were saying. Instead, they identify the social stratification. They show that gender certification, class certification, caste certification, religion. It's so with so many stratification, what exactly does the word community mean in terms of, of a homogeneous set of interests? Um, there are no examples, as I saw in their write-up, of communal resource management. I mean, sand is a communal resource. So if Eleanor Astrom, who got the Nobel Prize for writing that book, if she's right that communities can themselves, themselves manage their common resources, it's clear that in this case, it, that's not the case, that the, that the mafia, the sand mafia is controlling. And I think it's more realistic. Their presentation is really more realistic that way than what we should think before. So I want to go with these opportunities for product innovation because you know Chintan presented that and I love his work and what he's doing in India. So uh, I started thinking in this story that they laid out, uh, what, what can we take from this story about the need for innovations? And I found that, um, well, one backup, innovation, the literature on innovation, product innovation, particularly product innovation emerged in the mid eighties, as most of you know, it emerged in a response to failure of government providing services. So what government couldn't do, the, the, the innovations is going to bridge that. For government cannot provide water to the, everybody. Okay, so we're going to have our own, own, own bore wells. Government cannot provide electricity to everybody. So we're going to keep, keep our little off grid things. We're going to, so there are huge literature in the planning field on why these innovations were important in the 80s, particularly as the role of the state was being, being uh, rolled back. And in the story that, that they laid out, the couple of examples that emerged from it, very interesting. First is the building materials. It's very clear from the building, the photographs of the building, that there's a very big scope for building materials that are cheap, that are durable, that, are, that are, can, be, can, be, uh, can absorb the heat and in, in, in winter and, and, and make the place warm. There is room for cooking stoves. Again, I don't have to give you details because there's a huge amount of literature on these innovations, need for cooking stove. Water storage, they mentioned there are two different types of water storage and you know, one in which water is sealed in for, for drinking water. Now we can, is there room for innovation? Yes, on that. Pedal pumps versus water pumps. There is this possibility there. The last one I want to say, which is very funny because the book ends by where Shahil or I don't know, Shahil or, or uh, Radhika, they gave their, their uh, sleeping bag to these people whose houses they live because the people said, oh, this bag will be so useful for us because we sleep on the, on the field at night taking care of the cattle. And so they left the sleeping bag. So there is a need for that kind of an arrangement if people are sleeping on the ground in outside. So uh, I, I was very motivated by that. 
the question I want to end with is, if there is need for innovation, which is very clear, who exactly is innovating? And what is the process of innovation? And this is exactly what, what um, I think Chintan is trying to study when he calls the innovation ecosystem and to find out in that ecosystem, where can government uh, play a role? Though the, the literature innovation is pretty strongly biased against the state as if entrepreneurs are functioning on their own. But in reality, if you look at this innovation, many times government has played a role uh, by backing research, by giving funding, et cetera. So we can look at the redefinition of the role of the state, market, and civil society. And I want to end with this idea that we need to know better understand uh, where these innovations come from and to what extent these innovations, what will it take for these innovations to reach the people who, who um, Radhika and Sahil met on the way for the 10 day journey. So thank you. Thank you, Besh. Thank you so much. We much appreciate uh, your insights, and it's a remarkable testimony uh, to your uh, uh, teaching mentorship uh, and your department uh, that uh, your uh, students uh, uh, have produced uh, such uh, uh, insightful output. Uh, thank you so much. We are uh, momentarily waiting on Professor Jeff Sachs. Uh, I just texted his assistant and she said he should be uh, 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 joining momentarily. Uh, in the meantime, I think maybe we will take uh, 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 one, one or two questions and then uh, uh, we will move to Professor uh, Jeff Sachs. So Chintan, uh, you have some questions there. Maybe you can post the uh, one that is for Shail and Radhika that we have, uh, would you mind? And we will uh, have Professor Sachs uh, uh, momentarily. You want me to pose the question for Sahil and uh, Shail and Radhika? Sure. Yeah. You said? Okay. 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 So here's a question for you both. Uh, so your 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 book um, uh, very interestingly highlights uh, what the local people feel about large uh, government-led projects versus decentralized local solutions. So based on your interactions with these uh, local folks, can you comment on how you think uh, the government could encourage people to implement such local solutions while ensuring that uh, uh, there is coordinated planning and access to uh, given to marginalized uh, communities? So I am asking you that question on behalf of the government, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, I can just say a few words and then hand it over to you, Shale. Um, I think that when we're talking about decentralization, um, there are different ways that decentralization can take place. So I think it's important to first start with that. So when we're talking about decentralization, are we on one hand talking about deconcentration, which is more of what happens now in which administrative tasks are then given to the lower levels of government, such as the district level or the block level. And they're in charge of sort of implementing the plans that were formulated on the state level or on the central level. On the other hand, there also could be a process of an actual devolution of power in which the lower levels of government are given the responsibility to plan, implement, um, uh, uh, the projects as well as they're given the financial control over where the resources are going to go. So I think when we're talking about decentralization, there first has to be an acknowledgement of what is actually happening and what um, the, the different stakeholders involved would like to shift to. And um, I think that there's um, uh, right now, I think that what we can see in Bundelkhand, it's, it's very clear that it's more of a deconcentration of power in which the lower levels of government are tasked with an enormous amount of responsibilities for implementation and not too much actual um, sort of planning um, responsibilities or, you know, they're not tasked with actually figuring out where the finances are going to go or 
um, and, and that sort of thing. So I think that that is one of the main things that needs to be discussed when we're talking about decentralization. And as Bish mentioned, and we also talked about in our presentation, we do need to really complicate this, this idea of homogenous community that is you know, somehow magically able to carry out very perfect plans that will sort of help them um, become more resilient in the future. Um, and, and that needs to be sort of talked about a lot more. So over to you, Shil. Yeah, I think I think that hits the point. And just to add to what Radhika said, when we talk about decentralization, along with planning, it's also key to note the decentralization of financial resources. Because if we only decentralize planning powers way down in the in, in, in the supply chain of governance, without the financial resources, we know that that kind of pretty much dominates or dictates of how and what is planned. And that also helps to understand um, who are the key stakeholders in the region? One thing we realized through our walk and also through our research in Bundelkhand is that many times the stakeholders themselves are not identified even locally. And to build that kind of capacity, you need to decentralize finances way down in the governance levels also, almost to the village and the panchayat levels. And that I think is critical to kind of, not just from the, of course it needs to start from the government side, but at the same time there are enough India has a fantastic and robust kind of community-based organization that kind of, so we need to have a push from both sides for decentralization and kind of meet at a common point. Um, and I think if that is achieved and right, likely, rightly Radhika said, it's super tough to do that. It's gonna be an uphill task, it has been, but there are always starting points. We know that um, the, the, the water crisis or the drought itself is a starting point to my mind. These they're, they're just opportunities to kind of figure out what are those key pressing points, what are those key stakeholders, and what are those planning gaps that we need to identify to decentralize to start with. So I think that that will be my two cents for that. Yeah, no, I think that's <clears throat> very, uh, uh, very well said. I mean, I think the devolution or, or, or <clears throat> giving more power to. Uh, <clears throat> to lower levels of the government uh, is certainly uh, something that <clears throat> can have a big impact. If, if, there is, uh, if there's something that the COVID crisis taught us, it is this that uh, uh, where decentralized solutions were present, they seem to have worked much better than where they weren't present. So uh, very, very well said. Great, uh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you all. Um, and we'll continue this conversation and question and answer uh, after Professor Sachs' presentation. We have here Jeff Sachs, I introduced him to all of you at the beginning of this uh, event, this conversation. Uh, uh, since he wasn't here, uh, I, will, I will do this. <laughs> so, Professor Sachs uh, is a very distinguished uh, scholar and uh, policy designer, for want of a better phrase. He's been to India many times. He has advised Indian government, not only Indian government, many, many governments, the United Nations. Um, he is the, the conceptualizer of the Millennium Goals. I can go on. And he was a professor for a very long time at Harvard and now at Columbia. Uh, the university professor, the highest distinction that any university in Columbia uh, can, can uh, uh, award. And uh, he's the director of Earth, Earth Institute and Ecology, Environment, Sustainability, Sustainable Development. These are uh, uh, very important uh, to his uh, research, to his uh, advice and policy making. Over to you, Professor Sachs. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much. And a sincere apologies. Uh, uh, as usual, on a typical day, the Zooms are running, running late and uh, spilling over into each other. But maybe uh, before I uh, hold forth for a few minutes, you could describe to me where I could be most interesting, I hope, or fruitful for you um, in terms well, of topics. Okay, here is the, let me just say this, Professor Sachs. Uh, well, uh, we have about uh, 80 folks in the audience, just giving you a little feel of it. They are scattered all around the world. I mean, uh, in India and here. And um, we have had uh, uh, Chintan uh, Vaishnav, who is the director of the 
uh, Innovation, Atal Innovation Mission Center in India, uh, you know, in the Prime Minister's office and all that. He spoke about India's posture, what could be done, you know, I'm just giving you. And then two recent uh, alumni uh, of uh, MIT Department of Urban Planning have produced a remarkable book on Bundelkan. You probably got a copy of that. And they, they presented the themes of the book. And Professor Bish Sanyal, who's a very distinguished scholar at MIT in the Department of Urban Planning and Studies. And, Great. Uh, you know, he kind of critiqued the book. Now, you can tell us all about South Asia, all about India. You can take as much time as uh, you want, so long as it is uh, within 15 minutes. Perfect. <laughs> that, that's great. Thank you. So I, I think and then, we, and then we will take a few questions. Thank you. I, I, I probably won't use uh, all of the 15 minutes because I want to get straight to the questions. Okay. We have a we have a simple task. Uh, we need every part of the world to achieve sustainable development. Uh, meaning the sustainable development goals, ending poverty, ending hunger, universal access to uh, health care, education, uh, to uh, other basic infrastructure, and uh, to do it uh, in a green and sustainable manner with the climate safety uh, and uh, with the uh, conservation of uh, biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. So a small, a small task. Uh, we are not really on, on track for most of this. Uh, the world economy as it works today, uh, of course, is environmentally uh, utterly unsustainable in almost every dimension. Uh, ecosystems, biodiversity, and climate change, water, hydrologic cycle, you name it. Uh, we are fisheries. We're very, very far from what would be sustainable. Uh, also, the world economy uh, is not uh, a system of social justice uh, between countries or within countries. Uh, and we therefore have widening inequalities <laughs> between rich and poor, between typically uh, urban and rural, uh, between the advanced economies uh, and uh, the developing countries. And so on the three pillars of sustainable development, economic development, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability, we're basically striking out in at least two of the three. Uh, the social and the environmental. And when it comes to the economic development, it's a pretty mixed bag right now with a lot of countries uh, in crisis. So what do, what do we do? I like to take the view that we uh, think through how we could achieve the objectives uh, that we have set out, because at least we have the benefit of globally agreed objectives or nearly agreed objectives. Uh, 1.5 degrees C uh, is an objective. The 17 sustainable development goals are an objective uh, or set of objectives, complicated set of objectives. So I like to think about what are the pathways that are needed and what are the obstacles for fulfillment. Broadly, uh, in my way of thinking about this, I tend to think about six big buckets of transformation. The first is the education and innovation system, which I will put together because you need well-educated young people to have an innovation system as well. Second is the health and well being component, but especially the public health and clinical health systems of a country. Third is the energy transformation to zero carbon energy. Fourth is the land use transformation. Fifth is the urban transformation, because I continue to believe uh, that we will move to a overwhelmingly urban world, if for no other reason than that agriculture will be increasingly mechanized uh, and smart robots will do what people do now, 
on the whole, that will save a lot of people from backbreaking labor, but it also means that the children of today's farm families will be in cities and we need the urban planners for those cities, building the kind of cities we want uh, to live in. And the sixth transformation is the digital transformation, which I regard as the most important tools that we have, new tools, especially for the breakthroughs that we need. Uh, I'm not a fan of the metaverse, but I am a fan of telemedicine, distance education, e-governance, uh, public services online, uh, payments online, and so forth. Uh, and that means that uh, universal access to digital is absolutely crucial. So I think India will look a lot more urban in the future, but what kind of urban? Uh, urban, chaotic urban or livable, clean air urban? It's a big question for India. Uh, we saw during the pandemic, I think the terrible costs of generations of underinvestment in India's healthcare because the pandemic has really been catastrophic, much more than the official data show. And I think the failures of investment uh, have been a, a significant part of that. A lot of people died, a lot more people uh, than uh, the confirmed uh, death rate shows. Uh, we know that the educational system is still very spotty. Uh, and a lot of poor kids, especially in rural areas, don't finish upper secondary and don't have a quality uh, access to education either. And that is devastating for any country in the 21st century. So my basic orientation is how to make six successful transformations. And as soon as one thinks about that, there are at least uh, three dimensions to each of those transformations. One I would call the, the pathways, including the technological choices that uh, are needed in order to achieve the goals. Second uh, are the systems, uh, administration and management, public and private needed. And the third is the financing because uh, Everything costs money. Uh, and uh, I say thank God for that because otherwise there'd be no use for economists. So uh, at least uh, we, we know that we need a financial strategy that goes along with the public investment and institutional design strategies. All of these transformations have a time horizon in my view of at least a generation. So we need also a different kind of governance that can actually plan forward for a generation. This is very unusual in government. Uh, it's not the mindset of politicians. It's not the structure of government institutions. And so we lack plans. I doubt that India has a working plan even for the decarbonization by 2070. But I can say that if India had uh, worked harder on specific plans, it would be ready to decarbonize by 2050. Of course, financing and technology uh, available to support that. So it would be a conditional kind of pathway, but it would require a kind of planning that most governments are not doing adequately right now. And to my mind, therefore, there's a, a major challenge of governance. I know in the United States, since we don't have a planning ministry, we don't have an economy ministry, uh, we don't even have a finance ministry, really. We have a treasury, which is a bit different. Uh, we are not able to plan forward right now. Uh, and so everything ends up being uh, lobbying driven in the US Congress rather than planning driven. And that's one of the huge weaknesses of governance in the United States right now. What I find when you think about a 20 year forward plan, 
to meet the goals, two basic points. One, most of these big transformations are achievable in terms of resources and technology uh, that the world has available. We could decarbonize by mid-century. Uh, the International Energy Agency showed uh, in, in, I think, quite a intelligent and creative way how that could be done. Uh, but the second main point is we don't have the financial strategy to do this. Uh, if the Indian government looked and said, okay, we are going to get every child in school, we're going to get healthcare properly organized, we're going to make sure there's universal access for all of these key services, and we're going to decarbonize by massive, massive investments in renewable energy and in the transmission grid, uh, the finance minister would say, well, that's all fine, but we don't have the, the rupees to do it. And that would be correct. And so we need a financing strategy that is uh, aligned with these goals. And that's a strategy both at the national level and at the global level. At the national level, most governments don't think about their fiscal policy on a scale of 10 to 20 years. We see that in the debates in the United States right now, which are almost devoid of operational logic, all highly politicized, very little systematic. And on the international side, we live in a world of extreme inequalities of access to finance, where the United States can borrow, not quite endlessly, but it can borrow trillions, tens of trillions of dollars at low interest. But if India tried to do this, it would hit uh, a wall of financing. And India pays uh, yields that are multiples of what the US government pays. So one of the things I believe we need to do pretty quickly and urgently, and that I'm trying to work on myself, is reform the international financial architecture so that there is a lot more of the roughly $20 trillion of annual saving that is directed towards the developing countries and not only the developed countries. And for that, we need new financial engineering, a new role of development finance, new kinds of instruments, uh, but especially the intention to shift financing from developed to developing countries or to increase aggregate global financing in a systematic way so that we can achieve the kinds of agreements uh, that were debated in uh, Glasgow during the last two weeks. Uh, one of the shambolic aspects of COP26 is that the rich countries couldn't even come up with 100 billion of financing for the developing countries, even when the rich countries were writing their own scorecard, faking the numbers, as the Indian government rightly pointed out. They couldn't even fake the numbers to reach 100 billion, uh, which shows how little effort has been made to achieve equitable global financing. Because 100 billion a year, remember, is just one tenth of 1% of world output. But we haven't even designed a system for that rather meager level of resource mobilization. So perhaps I'll stop here and, and open it up to a discussion and uh, queries or questions. But just to summarize, we need several transformations energy, health, uh, education, uh, land use, urban design, and digitalization. And we need a financial structure that stands behind those to enable the requisite levels of investments to be made. And if we combined good pathways and policies with adequate financing, we could actually achieve sustainable development. In the end, the world will look more digital, better educated, 
and far more urban than it is today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs. Uh, you're always insightful, and I mean it most uh, sincerely. I've listened to you many times, and it never gets old. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. There's, there's always uh, a, a, a new insight, a new data, a new observation. Uh, of course, we live in a dynamic world, and that, uh, uh, therefore, you are constantly updating uh, in a Bayesian way about these things. So. Uh, we have all our panelists here, yourself, of course, and uh, Chintan, and now uh, we have Professor Sanyal and the two uh, uh, young uh, recent alumni uh, from MIT. So uh, Chintan, and you know, we are, I'm just saying, we, we have about 10 minutes, but maybe we'll extend it to 15 minutes, you know? So, so Chintan, go ahead with your two questions that you have, and then we'll see how we flow. Okay. So, so I think the couple of questions that were asked of me, uh, one was that um, which, agency, which agencies in India are involved in addressing smallholder farmers need water, soil health, <clears throat> soil health, sorry, and crop failures. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, and it also says, what have they done to support them? Uh, of course, uh, that's a rather long list, so that would be very hard to summarize. But the, the agencies are the Ministry of, of course, the highest level agencies are the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmer Welfare, um, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and the Ministry of Jal Shakti, which is the water ministry, the new water ministry. Um, and uh, uh, I think Jal Shakti in particular, just for everyone's understanding, it's it, it sort of uh, it, it, it brings together a lot of different people, the different pieces of the government that were touching water because water is such a uh, colossal subject um, under one roof. Uh, so I think these three, if one were to go, uh, <clears throat> uh, th these are the three that one would start with. Um, I uh, the the in terms of the answer to well, the Ministry of Commerce um, and um, Labor Welfare, I think, would have to, uh, uh, whether one thinks of it as an agriculture ministry or not, one would have to bring them into this mix also because, uh, you know, any transformation, uh, Professor Sachs talked about six transformations, very elegant framework any transformation that one thinks about in the Indian context, uh, uh, guess what? The supply side of it is the agriculture because that's where most people are. So they will have to go to wherever it is that we are wanting them to go to. Uh, and so in that sense, the commerce uh, is obviously involved. Um, uh, big schemes, um, I guess that's really hard to answer because there are so many of them. Uh, if maybe, one, maybe, maybe Professor Sachs, I don't want to call him an outsider, maybe he has a perspective on what he sees. Maybe, maybe he can summarize. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Happy to yeah. Professor. Well, I, I'm certainly not uh, an authority on this, so I was listening uh, to Chintan with the great interest. Uh, but just to say that, uh, of course, the uh, the environmental shocks that are coming to smallholders are going to intensify. Uh, and uh, there's also a tremendous amount of water stress, uh, especially in, in, in the highly populous uh, uh, grain belt uh, of uh, Haryana and uh, neighboring states. So uh, there's a lot to do on this. Uh, and. Uh, a major challenge. So I don't have the answers, but I was listening intently <laughs> to uh, to this. Uh, but the, the shocks are going to come more in, intensively, both because of the hydrology and the rising temperatures, which for India are going to really uh, be a lot of thermal stress on the crops. Wait, Professor maybe Sanyal, one Professor Sanyal, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that? Well, I'm... Uh... Thank you. I, I'm, I'm struck by these two different kind of perspectives, uh, both Chintan and, and Jeff 
both come from the very macro perspective and there is very important the issues there is are very important but the book that we discuss today is much more micro it's and as i was saying this emphasis in development theory from the economist point of view and modeling etc which was the beginning of the of the decades of development in 50s and by 70s we had moved to this opposite direction saying no it's micro anthropologists coming in this kind of walks around the river and I'm struck by these two different views. And the question is both are very relevant and how do they come together? So the issues that Jeff is raising about finance, et cetera, are central. And I think sometimes we made a mistake in the 70s, this, you know, dismissing top-down planning, dismissing any large scale projects uh, as if they didn't matter. And they, they do matter. And it's very clear to me from the presentations that also of Shahil and Radhika that they do matter. Now, they have been complaining that in their book that, look, this didn't reach the poorest of the poor. I think that that's why it's important to ask why not and what will it take? What will it take? Now, one issue that came up that uh, Sintan raised earlier about decentralization, he said, how is it going to work? Well, in the book, Radhika and Shahil, they mentioned the Gram Shava, they mentioned Panchayat. But they dismiss it very quickly, saying that the Gram Shabha is controlled by this Pradhan, who is very elitist, and he's working in hands in glove with the, with the sand miners, etc. But we have we created those institutions after a lot of work and amendments of the constitution, right? And so I really think if things have to be done on the ground level, we really need to look at how to make this make these organizations uh, function better so that the large scale projects that are being designed by the government, et cetera, indeed the benefits reach the poor. So that, 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 that I'm struck by the need for the micro and the macro to come together. Uh, GK, can I add a, uh, uh, a thought yeah, please. there? Please, uh, please. To build on that. I, I think, uh, I think Bish really, uh, Bish's comments provide uh, uh, very good clarity to what I was struggling to articulate. Uh, I, I think the challenge is not that there aren't schemes or policies for smallholder farmers. I mean, I think uh, in theory, if you just put these schemes on paper, they, they, they are beautiful. <laughs> the, the challenge is that there is an institutional void in the sense that the benefit of these schemes don't reach these intended uh, beneficiaries. That uh, and 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 in some pockets, some groups are doing wonderful work to link these farmers to these schemes and all that. And so there is nothing, no change to the scheme. Only thing is, the farmer who was intend, it was intended for, is now linked to the scheme. So so that's one part. The second is bottom up and the top down. I think uh, so. So I, I gave in uh, in my slides there was an example of this uh, millet farmer. Uh, uh, with uh, 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 sort of either a cold storage uh, or uh, some kind of an irrigation scheme, uh, a scheme that is uh, uh, decentralized, which is a solar power scheme. Uh, and and I, I, in the last year, for example, I studied the work of this uh, uh, this institution called Selco Foundation, which many of many people know. They've done wonderful work in India and and Africa. And, and through their work, I realized, so they build this decentralized, bottom-up uh, 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 energy access ecosystems where, where they start with uh, seeding uh, 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 an entrepreneur uh, uh, where they, uh, to whom they give the solar panels, but they also customize some or the other uh, 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 machine, whether it's a cold storage uh, or a roti roller or a silk weaving machine or whatever, it's, it's solar power. Uh, what it does is that it has, they built this infrastructure, but because they've built this livelihood mechanism on top of it, uh, it allows the person to earn from it and pay for the infrastructure. And now you have not only provided the access to energy, uh, but you have provided means for the person to pay for its productive use because the moment you give somebody a plug, they're gonna plug more and more things into it. Otherwise there would be no point in giving them an electricity access, right? Now, that what I, what I see is that 
that kind of bottom up system is very generative people can come up with new usages and infrastructure and applications can go and the grow and the region sort of uh, uh, becomes more prosperous now in this uh the top down building of infrastructure if one wants to build microgrids as government that part can be done top down with taxpayers money at a larger speed but it will not survive unless you couple it with this bottom up uh, ecosystem which is generative where that that uh, solar panel gives somebody some livelihood through uh, appliances, you know, so that that marriage, uh, it has to come come together. Uh, otherwise, neither of them by its uh, the, uh, it's a well probably the bottom up would survive more so than the top down, but the top down down alone would certainly not survive. Radhika, you Chintan, have... which foundation was that that you mentioned? Sorry, Se Selco Foundation. Sel S Selco. L That's right. S E L C O. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. Radhika, you have a thought. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Radhika. Yeah, I think just to just to add a um, a few more sentences on this. I mean, I think it's really important to note whether these large government projects are sort of continuous schemes, like the Manrega scheme, sort of de uh, dedicated to providing employment during times of distress, or whether they're responses to crises, which is, I think, much more of what we see in the context of Bundelkhand, where there are huge government packages and there are huge infrastructure projects directed at trying to uh, you know, s mitigate the crisis, directed at emergency response. And I think that's where things get a little bit more difficult and tricky and end up sort of leading to outcomes that um, are often just, you know, kind of a waste of money. Infrastructure fails after a couple of years, you know, things don't get solved. I mean, just this, um, I was just reading this uh, news article about how the government has apparently promised that every single part of Bundelkhand would receive piped water by the end of the year. Um, but a report in 2016 showed that just you know, five to 18%, depending on the state that you're in, um, areas in Bundelkhand have functioning hand pumps. So, I mean, it's these sort of large goals that are often politically motivated in times of crises, in times of drought that are so reactionary and often aren't really able to, you know, um, solve these very systematic entrenched um, issues that say more long-term schemes could possibly try to intervene. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Chintan, you have another question with you. Uh, isn't that right? And maybe you read that out and then we'll see how that goes. And then maybe we take another one after that, if not. I'm, I'm afraid that I'm uh, called uh, in, uh, to be in Geneva online. Uh, in, so I'm, I'm gonna have to uh, duck okay. out, but okay, uh, thank so you. You. Can, you can listen to the question and then go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, right. here's the question. What role can India play in leading uh, uh, leading conversation around uh, future prospects of sustainable development in the region and globally? Professor Fox, you want to say something? Two minutes? I, I do. Uh, I want to say something uh, d difficult uh, and uh, problematic, uh, and that is uh, I think regions should cooperate with each other. Uh, and uh, as an economist, I know that trade, ecosystems, rivers, air pollution, everything is about neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, I want to see in South Asia more cooperation across the countries because this would be hugely beneficial uh, for everybody concerned. Uh, you know, all these, uh, and I don't want to oversimplify, but uh, because there's lots of tension and real reasons for uh, tensions between neighbors. So I don't want to oversimplify. I just want to say the, the benefits of uh, cooperation between India, Pakistan, China, uh, neighbors would be phenomenally large in the issues we're talking about. So, uh, just wanted to put that on the table because the word region was mentioned, which is my favorite word that we need regional cooperation. Right. 
Thank you, Professor Sachs. We really appreciate it. And we'll be Th thanks a lot. Great to see everybody. So thank, thank you thank for including thank me. You, thank, Bye -bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Okay, Chintan and Bish, uh, uh, what sure. role can India play? And maybe we'll get Bish going, then Chintan, and maybe Radhika and Shai will have, uh, then we may have to wind up at that point. But go ahead. Yeah. Well, very quickly, I mean, Chintan raised a very, it's a very important question. And I think that. Um, Again, tying it back to the conversation today, um, what India can play a role, the government, central government has a big part to do, and as you know, Chintan very well. But coming back again to the book by Radhika and Sahil, I want to say that kind of detailed knowledge of how poor people manage their lives and how they are incredibly efficient in what they do and with very limited resources. And I think we need to know that well, we think we know, but we really don't know that much about the lives of the poor, I know Abhijit and, and Esther, and they all wrote about it. And I think that, that we need to understand their ways of living and how that will be affected by the kind of changes that we want. And the pathway is not that clear cut to me that it's so, so, so sure, like as, as Jeff said, the seven transformation. Transformation is a very difficult thing. It's easier to sit on the top and say, well, transformation. Transformation is grounded. And that's why it will show in the, in the next time Radhika and Shahil works, walks another 10 miles or some, some other place, they will probably see the signs of transformation. So I am very taken by this issue of the macro policies and the micro response by the, by the poor. And I think there's a lot of interesting work that can be done there. Intan, any thoughts, closing thoughts on this before we say thank you? <laughs> sure. Well, first of all, let me say thank you to Radhika and Shell for uh, doing all this wonderful work. Uh, I also, I mean, today's conversation, I, I, I took the macro vantage point, uh, uh, but um, in the last six, seven years, I have spent at least about 16, 17 months put together living and working in rural to very rural India. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, this disconnect is real, although it's not intended uh, mm. often, but it's real. Um, and uh, Bundelkhand is uh, a place where we at one end of that, at that extreme end of even that disconnect as a spectrum. So, so I think, uh, uh, now that uh, that said, I mean, in theory, uh, this is possible to overcome, right? I mean, in practice, there are lots of challenges to getting there. Uh, but India, in this question was about, can India be uh, uh, an example? And I think India is probably the best position to be in, an example. The reason to me is very simple, that uh, India has, one, and one of them is unfortunate. I mean, India has the entire spectrum of problems. So you, you, you uh, can work on solving them, right? People are working on solving them. The second is that you, no matter what solution you come up with, the demand curve is continuous. So it's not a bi-modal demand curve that there are only very few rich and very poor. There's this whole step. So you have you, or any, any solution, will have an application. And so then you can learn something and then others can learn from it. I was giving the example of the Selco Foundation. They're the first one to build these energy access ecosystems and they work, I mean, they work very hard uh, on it, but they work a and they're hard to build. These ecosystems are 10, 15 years of work, each of them. Uh, and and uh, uh, India, it's been possible to do it because of the, you know, political situation is democracy, uh, uh, the, the people with education, all of that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for it, India to serve as an example to uh, other regions and uh, to, 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 for it to really work. Uh, the, I think the word that Jeff used very rightly is cooperation. Thank you. Radhika and Shail, you have uh, 15 seconds thought each, maybe it's 20, but <laughs> go ahead. Shine, go fast. Um, yeah. yeah, sure. No, I just want to say thank you to Chintan, Bish, Jeff, who is not here right now. 
um, for joining us and giving pretty insightful conversations. Um, we know Bish pretty well since our time at MIT, and we expected um, to have a great insights from him, as he always does. Um, and just one quick last point, a closing thought on the previous question and what Bish was talking about the micro and macro and what Ratik was talking about in terms of projects was that I think it's also important for us to acknowledge that many of times when those projects are done as a reactive gesture by the government at any level, they do not acknowledge the associated projects that need to be done for this to be successful. For example, when many toilets are built in rural parts of India, the government claims that all oh, the toilets are built but the sanitation lines are not connected. The sanitation planning is not done. Now, for that to happen, a systematic thinking needs to be done where what are those associated sectors and industries that need to come together? And then what is that project that kind of, you know, brings the, all the sectors together? And that is the kind of critical thinking we need. Um, Radhika, if you'd like to say anything. Radhika. Yeah, no, just, yeah, just echoing, um, echoing Shale, thank you so much, everyone. Um, this was, a great conversation and I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to have it. Um, just a few last words about India being a sort of, you know, leader um, in this area. I think that there are so many interesting things going on in different parts of India, many different attempts by NGOs, by, you know, local governments, by individuals to try to solve some of these issues. And, um, you know, an example is crop insurance. An example in Bundelkhand is Jal Sahelis, which are um, groups of women that are building rainwater harvesting systems and and sort of, and that's spreading in, in, in many different villages. So I think that we can see a lot of different ways in which very interesting things are being done. And perhaps, you know, a lot can be learned from them and, and a lot more attention should be paid to them. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Chintan. Thank you. Thank you, Besh. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you, Shail. And thank you to all our partners, Sarah ESSN, Water Club, and MISTI, and everyone, and the Harvard South Asia Graduate School of Design, the, the students from there. It's been a marvelous 100 minutes, 102, 103 minutes. And thank you all for your time, your consideration. And uh, we'll be back, and we will be in touch with you. And uh, if uh, you're interested in this, uh, and you can facilitate and, and, and participate and be engaged, Please do send me an email, connect with us. We would love to hear from you. Thank you all. Have a delightful afternoon, evening, night, or whatever is appropriate, depending on where you are. Thank you all. Good night. Thank Good you day. so much. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thank you so much.